In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I heard not long ago that people who take off their shoes at the movies, at work, or even at the dinner table live two, maybe three years longer than those people who don't. Lots of you, some of you at least, maybe have been spending hours at the shoe store buying shoes for children to go back to school, or maybe you've bought new shoes yourself. I just told Randy I was in the first pair of heels in three years, so if I take them off during the sermon, you'll understand why. But remembering the days of spending lots of time in shoe stores trying to find to shoes for my children, I was amused by the statistic of those who take their shoes off living longer. With shoes on, what do you feel? Feel your feet in your shoes. What do you feel? You feel leather. You may feel socks binding, but when you take your shoes off, isn't there a wonderful sense of freedom? A wonderful sense of comfort and relaxation? Moses' life was changed in an instant when he saw a bush that was burning but not consumed by fire. And as he turned aside with curiosity to pay attention to the bush, he scarcely imagined what he was getting into. This was the fault line running right down the middle of his life. It was the thin place where he experienced the power and the presence of the Lord as God called out to him, Moses, Moses, here I am, responded Moses. And then the Lord said, remove your sandals, for the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. We may feel some sense of freedom when we take our shoes off, but there, there is a truth that we are vulnerable to pain. You might step on a bee or bump into that dresser in the dark. You see, holy ground is not soft and gentle ground, but it's full of life with all its wonder and all its risks. It is the place where human beings find their meaning. Holy ground, David Adam, the Celtic writer and teacher, the former vicar of Lindisfarne, calls holy ground borderlands, the places where daily life and eternal life touch, places which remind us where we have been and point us to the future. They're at the very edge of the familiar, reaching out to new horizons. They're also called thin places, places where our hearts are opened and God breaks through, holy ground to be sure. There are places of hope and wonder that point, that like that point on the horizon where the earth touches the sky and the day turns to night or the night to day. And we pray that God will lift us up that we might see further. The Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, call Moses to cross the threshold, to reorient his life, to become the instrument of salvation for God's people. God said, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. I have known their suffering. I have never seen a burning bush, but I have seen a pine forest burn to the ground and reborn after a few years. I've seen the wonder of the sun hitting the red and gold of the maple trees in the Blue Ridge Mountains in the fall. And I have watched from Artist Point in an instant as the sun transformed the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone into breathtaking yellows and reds and green. And I have walked out of St. Columbus Chapel, that little tiny chapel that's a thousand years old after a service of Teze chants and watch the moon rise over St. Columba's Bay off of the island of Iona. And at the cathedral, the National Cathedral in Washington, I have watched the winter sun turn those dull gray stones into bright 
colors of purple and green and red and gold and blue. Holy ground, where the wonder of creation calls us to stop and pay attention. As the ancient storyteller continues with the story of the call of Moses, we hear that Moses, that little baby who was saved, who was rescued from Pharaoh's law demanding that all boy children be killed, and then he was brought up in Pharaoh's own household, we hear Moses express his fear. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let the people go? Who am I to do this? Five times Moses refuses his commission. And five times God counters, giving Moses the assurance that the Lord would be with him. The Lord's response was, I will be with you. And Moses says, but what is your name? And the Lord said, my name is I am. Or I am that I am. Or I will be that I will be, or I am who endures. We call him the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God said, this is my name forever. This is my title for all generations. Bring my people out of Egypt to worship me on this mountain. Now in the stories in the gospel, Jesus emerges as the I am of God, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, giving the blind their sight, preaching the good news to the poor and to the outcast, inviting all sorts and conditions of people to share with him the bread of life. Jesus said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. Choose to see the world in a new way. Choose to see the world through God vision. Choose to participate in the intimate sharing of joys and trials of life. Jesus assumed that his followers would suffer persecution, just as he did. And the writer of the gospel knew firsthand of the loss of life, of families, of homes, of identity. And Jesus' call to follow him, his invitation, takes suffering seriously. This is such a radical concept that it's easy for us to disregard or to misinterpret it. Taking up our cross is not, as my grandmother presumed, as she lived 70 years with the sorrow and sadness and loneliness of a widow. It is not about tolerating the abuse or the torture or the execution of people because they interpret God's will in a different way or because they are of a different race or nationality. It is not the turning of a blind eye to human trafficking and enslavement. Nor is it the cross to bear of accepting the abuse of power by anyone in authority or any disease. Such an interpretation of call to take up our cross misses Jesus' point entirely. Rather than taking up our cross, Rather, taking up our cross is what Yahweh called Moses to. That is to be an instrument of Yahweh's passionate sharing of human life, the vulnerability of love of others, love capable of suffering, love capable of compassion, love capable of showing mercy. It is about taking off our shoes and walking on holy ground. Several years ago, one of the teenagers in my parish at St. Albans gave me a bird's nest. 
And I kept it on my shelf in my office at St. Albans, and then I replaced it periodically as it fell apart, as birds nest are wont to do. Edmund wanted me to be reminded of the responsibility I have for the world around me. And now I treasure a painting of a bird's nest. It symbolizes the gentle holding of new life, the protection and the loving care given by the parent to guarantee the future. Hold your hands out. Cup them like this. Like a child does when they have something very precious and dear in their hands. Hold it like a bird's nest. It symbolizes the connectedness of all creation and affirms the gracious goodness of God. When you cup your hands as if to hold a bird's nest, something special happens in the intimate focus of attention and caring have you noticed how children do that? Have they gaze into their cupped hands with deep wonder at a butterfly or a flower or maybe even a bird's egg? Cupped hands, like that bird's nest, express and enable relationship. Relationship that waits to cherish and to serve the future. I wonder I wonder what future God sees for us, for you, and for me as individuals, for us as a parish here at St. James's, for this city of Richmond. We know that out there in the world that there is chaos and violence. It is real, and it is dangerous. We know, too, that the roots of violence and poverty are complex, and that there are systematic causes, systemic causes, which can be eliminated only with a radical change in our perceptive. The wonder of Jesus' teaching was that there was no dividing wall. There were no barriers of legal, social, racial, or religious rules. There were no doors shut or windows barred. There was no concern about who had the right to be an insider for there were no outsiders. This compassionate welcoming is costly because it cause, causes us to be moved by the pain of others. And if we let that pain touch us, it will transform our lives. I close with my favorite blessing. Tread lightly upon the earth, for it is the dwelling place of God. Deal gently with all living things, for they were created by God. Live simply, humbly, and joyfully, for you too are a beloved child of God. Amen.